I feel real accommodating today. Okay, so I want to do uh, a little short presentation on plate tectonics first, and then just a couple of special topics. Uh, I mean, how can we go through geology on Mars without talking about Valles Marineris or the Tharsis bulge, which is you know these the, these two very prominent features. So, uh, what do we? What do you all know about plate tectonics? Let's let's be a little bit more interactive today. In general, Jeffrey. Plate tectonics are the response are the cause of almost all earthquakes. Well, all earthquakes. Yeah. They are a large, if not entire, part of our crust. Okay, so it has to do with our the crust of the Earth. Okay. Um, you're talking about plates, because. Plates are physical objects. We'll talk about plate tectonics is a is a process that uh, adjusts how those plates are distributed around the globe. What else? Seven large ones. I'm not sure. I mean, that's the kind of thing I would. Google myself because I don't have space for yeah. <laughs> that kind of detail. But no, plate tectonics clearly, I want to, I guess, make the point that plate tectonics really revolutionized the study of geology on the Earth um, and was a really cool example, if you're in, into the history of science, of a real scientific revolution taking a field by storm to such extent that we had geologists working in the, in the area publishing research where, um, you know, from one month of paper submitted one month uh, had a totally different um, interpretation of, of uh, the geological processes that the researcher was looking at in a, in a paper uh, published, you know, later that, that same year. So the, this is an idea that really has um, one main name uh, that kind of gave rise to this, to this idea. Um, Alfred Wegener came up with the idea of plate tectonics. But this is an interesting story because he came up with the idea of plate tectonics before the field was ready to um, address the idea of plate tectonics. He, um, how many of you in grade school looked at the map of the Earth and looked at South America and looked at Africa and say, well, you know, they, those kind of look like they fit together? I, mean, I know I, I, I did that. He, he did that a long time ago. Uh, and came, he came up with the original hypothesis about plate tectonics. That is, the idea that the crust of the Earth was broken up into these separate plates and that these plates could move around. The idea that the surface of the Earth was not some fixed um, structure the way geologists had previously um, thought about it. He marshaled together several kinds of, of evidence. I mean, starting with that simple observation that, gee, it looks like the continents could be fit together if you could actually move them around on the globe. You know, Africa, uh, South America fits up onto the bulge of Africa, and, you know, North and South America uh, fit together. He extended that further by marshalling other evidence, such as we saw, if you, if you were actually able to do that, you would actually see that geological formations that occur on the east coast of South America appear to continue into the west coast of Africa. You see similar kinds of fossil assemblages tying them together. So there's a lot of, of evidence that could be explained. There's a lot of, of observations about the world around us that could be explained if we... Um, except the idea that continents can move around. 
But Wagner at the time had no mechanism by which to cause continents to move around. You know, his idea was that, well, somehow these continental plates or these, these areas of continents must somehow be dragged through the crust of the earth. And there's just no force in that any of the geologists of the time could think of that would actually allow that process to occur. So here's an example of a hypothesis that does a very good job of explaining the data that Wagoner put together in terms of geological formations and fossils and you know other kinds of, of actually even the the um, the distribution of related species of organisms. So you've got, you know, ostriches in uh, Africa. You've got rheas, which are also large flightless birds that were in South America. So, you know, if Africa and South America were at one point joined together and had some ancestral large flightless bird and the continent split apart, you could explain why we ended up with ostriches in Africa and rheas in South America. So a lot of, of patterns in the world could be explained by plate tectonics, but there's no mechanism that could be proposed by Wegener or anyone else working in the field. And so people kind of poo-pooed the idea. Uh, what time period was he like, proposing these things? This was uh, early uh, 20th century, so 19 teens in that, that time frame. Uh, he also had a strike against him in that he was not a geologist by training. He wasn't a member of the tribe. He was actually a, a climatologist uh, and was proposing this kind of radical revolutionary theory in geology. And, you know, it just gained no traction among the geologists. So he went back to climate studies uh, he was very interested in uh, polar um, weather patterns and uh, went on a number of polar expeditions. Unfortunately, he died on one of them, and so you know, that's the end of his story. And he died before um, plate tectonics was really adopted by geology as a kind of organizing idea. Uh, so... You know, modern day interpretation of how our planet works is this separation between crust and mantle, and then there's the core, there's the outer core and the inner core that we've talked about when we were talking about global magnetic fields. Um, and we already talked a little bit about how we can actually know what's going on inside the Earth. But part of this uh, process is that people now realize that heat flows through the mantle part of this so this region here between the crust and the core is the mantle and heat flow from the core to the surface as the earth cools off drives these movements of material in the mantle where these large convection cells. Um, the mantle is made of rock, but it's warm enough that it's kind of like plasticky and can move under heat and pressure. And so the idea we know now is that as these convection currents take place in the mantle, they can drag the plates of crust along with them. The crust, the continents do not have to be dragged through the crust. The whole crust itself moves along as these uh, uh, convection belts play out in the mantle. Uh, so adoption of plate tectonics theory for the Earth really didn't come until <coughs> geophysicists had a mechanism that could actually explain how it could happen. And this happened in the late 50s. Uh, I think it was 1957 was the International Geophysics Year where we had researchers from countries around the globe collaborating on these you know, kind of global studies of the physics of planet Earth. And uh, it was a lot of the work that came out of that time period 
that led to this you know, revolutionary change in how we thought about the earth. If you go back to think about what Lowell was talking about, about how the earth developed, I mean, Lowell clearly had no concept of plate tectonics. Um, you know, this can explain why we used to see an inland sea in North America because of the movement of these continental pieces of crust. Clearly, things are going to be changing. Um, so Lowell didn't know that and, and, and led, to, led him to you know, some of the incorrect suppositions that, uh, that we discussed earlier. So uh, we do have, um, you know, if we look at the surface of the earth, we do have these major continental and oceanic plates. The continental plates tend to have thicker crust. Uh, the oceanic plates tend to be thinner, and there are, of course, these plate boundaries. And uh, we're interested in what's going on at the plate boundaries because, for a very practical reason, you know, if you look at where earthquakes occur in North America, where are we most likely to have earthquakes? West Coast. You know, Southern California. Although the three years I was out in Southern California, I felt no earthquakes. I moved to Michigan. Ones, like, yeah, there, there, there are hundreds, thousands of minor earthquakes. Earthquakes have to be probably above three, three and a half on the Richter scale before people begin to to feel them. But basically, you know, we we get earthquakes when these uh, plates at the plate boundaries. <laughs> undergo some fracture and, you know, friction is released and the plate boundaries move. That leads to uh, propagation of seismic waves that we can feel as earthquakes. And if it's a large enough break, then, of course, we start getting damage and, and destruction. Does no Mars have earthquakes like that? What? Does Mars get earthquakes? Well, that's, the, well, that's one of the big questions. I mean, there probably are Mars quakes. But as we'll talk, we'll, we'll see uh, a little bit later in this presentation, Mars probably does not have the same plate tectonics processing going on today that we have here on the Earth. There is, that's still under debate. Um, there are, are people who look at some of the things we can see on Mars and say that looks like uh, it could be um, evidence for plate tectonics in the past. Like the soils not active on Mars, like it is on Mars. What, Nolan? Like the soil isn't like active, you know, like moving, like you know how plates are moving, that's what they are. Right, yeah. First of all, we don't, have, we don't have the GPS sensors or the seismo uh, seismometers on Mars to really know how active Mars is today. There's probably some activity in the crust. Even without plate tectonics, there's probably some situations that would lead to uh, rock formations under the ground fracturing and leading to uh, seismic activity. But clearly, Mars is not as active as the Earth, and we would expect once we do get uh, seismic stations set up on Mars, that we would be recording a lot lower frequency of Mars quakes than we have earthquakes here on the Earth. Uh, so, just uh, a, a little summary of the kinds of tectonic processes that take place because of plate tectonics. If you've got these plates moving around, they can move around in different uh, ways. We can have uh, two plates that are slipping past each other. Um, this would be the case with the San Andreas Fault, for example, in, in Southern California. The Pacific Plate is moving up to the northwest uh, compared to the North American Plate. And within, I don't know, some tens of millions of years, um, Baja California will be up adjacent to Seattle as the plate continues to move up there. Uh, I won't be around at the time, but uh, we can... How long is that going to take? Uh, it would be tens of millions of years. Oh, okay. I thought you were saying, like, we might be around. No. 
No. <laughs> so, um, so plates can slip past each other. They can um, pull apart. They can push together. Uh, these are, you know, kind of compressional events when the plates are converging. Here's a. Yeah, you basically can have divergent or convergent plate boundaries. We tend to. I mean, the, the major divergent plate boundary on the Earth is the uh, mid-oceanic ridges. So I won't go back to the previous slide because I'm recording, but if you look down through the center of the Atlantic Ocean Basin, uh, same thing, well, mostly on the Atlantic Ocean Basin, you can see places where the uh, plates that make up the basin for the Atlantic Ocean are pulling apart. And as those plates pull apart, what's going to replace that material? That, what's going to fill in that void as these plates pull apart? M magma, basically mantle material coming up from, um, from the mantle, filling in that, that, that void as these plates pull apart. In places where the plates are converging, uh, you have only a couple of things that can happen. Either one plate will dive down below the other plate and get recycled back into the mantle, remelted. That's how we get, you know, uh, metamorphic and sedimentary and igneous rock formations from the crust back down into the mantle where it can be remelted to form you know, magma that will produce new igneous rock when, when that erupts. Um, the other option that might happen is that the plates, if they basically collide, they can crumple and uh, cause uh, a large uplift of land. No one? No, sinkholes are more localized phenomena. Generally, you get sinkholes when you've got underground limestone formations, and the limestone gets eroded away, and you've got this big cavity, and um, the underground cave can, can collapse, uh, leading to the sinkhole. You can also get... Um, well, you can get subsidence of the landscape if... Um, a lot of subsurface water is being pumped out. So in areas where there's a lot of, of agriculture, irrigation going on, you can get subsidence, not necessarily sinkholes. Uh, but now the, um, the uh, probably the best example of this kind of convergence leading to um, an uplift is when the uh, plate that India is a part of, which used to be connected to Antarctica, it basically moved north through the Pacific Ocean and slammed into Asia. And what large geological feature, uh, geographic feature, is just north of India? The Himalayas. Himalayas, okay. So the reason why the Himalayas are the tallest mountains on the Earth currently is that India basically just smacked into Asia so hard that it lifted up this whole um, you know, massive uh, structure. The um, Rocky Mountains and the Appalachian Mountains are also these kinds of uplifts. Um, the Andes Mountains in South America uh, is basically uh, very um, active uh, in terms of earthquakes and so forth because you've got one plate boundary diving in under the other leading to lots of seismic activity, as well as the uplift of, of the Andes. Um, just a, a quick point here. Plate tectonics is very important for us. We would have a much crappier planet if it weren't for plate tectonics. Uh, plate tectonics, in general, functions to uh, transfer heat from the center of the earth to the core, from the core to the crust uh, to be radiated out into space. So that's just more of a geological thing. But 
this plate tectonics is responsible for the recycling of crust down into the mantle, the remelting and uh, uh, recycling of those materials. Uh, very important, of course, for the creation of continental crusts, and um, it's likely that early in Earth's history there was a lot less continental surface because it takes a while for this, these plate tectonic forces to kind of generate the thicker, less dense crustal plate that would actually sit up high enough to be above the ocean. And, you know, as primates, uh, we kind of like living on the Earth's surface rather than sw swimming around the water. So, you know, plate tectonics has really been responsible for the creation of the continents as we know them. But probably most important is plate tectonics plays a very important role in atmospheric regulation. So... Um, I don't think um, I'll take the time to talk about the carbon silicate cycle in detail, but when volcanoes erupt, lots of gases are given off. What do you expect to be in the gases that are in a volcano? There's going to be carbon dioxide, there's going to be steam, which is water vapor. There's oftentimes some hydrogen sulfide, so forth. So volcanoes generally are responsible on a geological time scale in putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And what impact does carbon dioxide have on the on our planet's temperature? It raises it. Right. So carbon dioxide, water vapor, uh, they're both important greenhouse gases. And a natural level of greenhouse gas is very important for the Earth because if we had no greenhouse effect at all, um, Earth would not be habitable. It would be too cold. We would be living in, well, we would not be living um, basically on an icy planet. So some amount of natural greenhouse uh, uh, effect is beneficial from our perspective. It uh, adjusts the temperature. Um, this recycling, though, kind of provides a, a thermostat. Um, so if there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, um, uh, basically that will lead to increased weathering of the crust. You get more uh, absorption of carbon dioxide into oceanic sediments. And those oceanic sediments eventually get recycled back down in the mantle. This crustal recycling due to plate tectonics is really the main way to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere on geological timescales. So if we had no plate tectonics going on on the Earth and volcanoes just continue to put carbon dioxide and water vapor into the atmosphere, we would eventually have a kind of a runaway greenhouse effect, which is essentially what's happened on Venus. Um, so this is, I mean, I'm, I'm presenting this in a little bit just disjointed format, but Venus is a situation where if there ever was plate tectonics, it is clearly shut down, and there is no more recycling of carbon dioxide back into the crust through uh, plate tectonics. So continued volcanic activity on Venus just keeps pumping more and more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And over time, even though Venus possibly started out very similar to the Earth, it has gone on this trajectory that has just turned it into a, a hellish place uh, where it's hot enough basically to melt lead on the surface of the planet. Okay. Um, that actually is probably the fate of the Earth uh, down the road. So as the sun heats up, our oceans are going to boil away, plate tectonics will shut down, volcanic activity will continue, and eventually Earth will go the same way as Venus.
So enjoy the plate tectonics while it's happening, uh, and enjoy the relatively nice uh, environmental conditions. Okay, so are there plate tectonics on Mars? We have very little evidence for current plate tectonics. Um, you know, what are some of the things we see on the Earth because of plate tectonics? We see large mountain ranges. We see you know, places where there are subduction zones, places where there are plate boundaries and, and so forth. Uh, on Mars, we don't see anything corresponding to the Andes mountain range or the Rocky Mountains. We don't see anything like the Himalayas on Mars. We see Tharsis that I'll talk about briefly, but um, you know nothing that looks like um, uh, plate tectonic uh, plate tectonics going on currently. So the big question, as is oftentimes the question for Mars, well, you know Mars looks kind of dead, but not quite dead today. But what was it like in the past? Do we have any any evidence of plate tectonics in the past? Um, It's not great evidence. Uh, if we look, for example, we talked before about the magnetic field of the Earth flips back and forth every now and then, right? Mm -hmm. So if, you th if we go back to the Earth for a minute, if you look at the magnetized crust in the Atlantic Basin, what you see as the plates spread apart and we get new crust being formed over time, what we see are, are magnetic bands of reverse polarity in the, um, in the Atlantic Ocean crust. And I should have uh, put a picture of that in here, or wait, maybe I did. So we see this pattern. This is, this is the pattern from um, Mars Global Surveyor, where we see these, we see these mag, uh, ma remnant pieces of crust that are magnetized in the old southern highlands, as was talked about in that video. Here's the picture I was looking for. So uh, we see a similar kind of phenomenon on the Earth in the uh, Atlantic Basin. We talked about how we've got a divergent plate boundary here where the eastern half of the Atlantic Basin is heading off to the east and the western part is heading off to the west. And so the distance between North America and Europe is getting slightly larger year by year by year. The distance between Africa and South America is also getting slightly larger year by year by year. As this new crust is developed at this um, divergent plate boundary, the molten rock material that solidifies will pick up the magnetic field that is currently present on the Earth, where we've got the north magnetic field in the north, and the south magnetic field in the south. But if we look at older crust, basically the further away you get from the mid-Atlantic ridge, the older the crust is, because it's kind of like a conveyor belt, producing new crust and then carrying it away. So, so this crust here would have been produced, you know, maybe 100,000 years ago. This crust here might have been produced 200,000 years ago. Again, the further away you get uh, from the ridge, the older the crust is. And what geophysicists looked or found when they looked at oceanic crust uh, samples taken back in that international geophysical year in 1957 was this very strange pattern of magnetic reversals that's been recorded in the crust. Um, and so th the explanation for that would be that, well, we actually do have the plates moving away from each other. This is really kind of some of the first evidence 
that really um, changed the opinion of geologists about whether or not plate tectonics could actually occur. So when people saw this pattern on Mars, they thought, well, maybe those differences that reverse polarity from spot to spot on the old southern highlands in terms of its magnetic polarity, you know, might be a similar kind of process where um, you've got this kind of conveyor belt of a plate moving away from some um, place where new crust is being produced and it is uh, um, picking up the magnetic reversals that probably happened during the first half billion years on Mars. Yeah. Um, again, we don't know until we get more better until we get better data until we get actual geophysical stations on Mars we probably will not know um, possibly, yeah I mean, it's possible that Mars always was one continuous plate it's still an open question uh so this, this, pad, this evidence was put forward as, well, maybe this is evidence for plate tectonics in the past, but you can also get this pattern just by um, um, by a uh, previously magnetized bit of crust kind of breaking up into pieces uh, for reasons that aren't related to plate tectonics. So this is not real strong evidence of plate tectonics. Probably the closest thing that Mars has to a mountain range are these series of you know, high elevation mountain lay, mountain uh, looking um, structures that are in this Thalmasia region, um, and of course this is this is near the Tharsis bulge. So there's clearly been a lot of uh, you know geological activity going on in this area. So I'm not going to bother going through through these different models, but you know. It's possible that Mars has had the kind of convection currents in the mantle that would lead to plate movements in the past, but clearly there is no plate tectonics going on today. And so all the kinds of crustal recycling and impacts of plate tectonics that we talk about as going on on the Earth are, are clearly not going on on Mars today.